Hello everyone. I am here recording the weekly video for you. I'm not going to record the intro slides. I'm just going to record the, the class slides. <coughs> the intro slides are essentially an overview of the class, so there's no real um, need to, to record a lecture for it. So I uh, <coughs> first, you know, for the online course, formally introduce myself. I am Dr. Daniel Jude, and um, I will be your stats professor this semester. And uh, a little bit about me before I get started. I work at Brown Foreman as a data and analytics specialist. I also work at UofL as a, an assistant professor, an adjunct assistant professor. And uh, that means I am a uh, basically a professor, but you know the lower ranking professor. You got assistant professor, associate professor, professor. Those are the three ranks of professor. And, um, you know, where I'm new and young, I'm um, assistant professor. So that's, uh, that's uh, where we're at with that. And um, also, you know, just want to make sure everyone is having a great semester. And hello. So let's get started with the course. And let's get started with the, um, the first lecture. So uh, one of the things I want to go over is measures of central tendency. And uh, for measures of central tendency, that is essentially the mean, the median, and the mode. Your textbook does offer that fourth measure, which is the trend mean. Um, but central tendency refers to the value around which most values tend to cluster. And I will definitely show you some more on that. Let me uh, grab my pen here. All right. So let's actually make this a different color. Can I make it a different color? Yes. There we go. So I want to kind of like, you know, draw out what, you know, a normal curve is. Well, it's not quite, you know, the best looking normal curve. Imagine this is completely symmetrical and not lopsided. Right? And uh, I'm going to draw a line down the middle like so. And this is what you call the normal curve. Normal curve. So, normal curves occur when your mean, when your mean, where is my cursor? Here it is. When your mean, your median, and your mode all are the same number. It's very important to know. So, that, that's what we're, this whole uh, PowerPoint is going to be about. So, Let's move forward. The mode is then, we'll get, break them down one by one. The mode is, e, any distribution is the value that, certain, it's, it's the value that occurs the most, okay? Uh, so the set scores are 58, 82, 82, 90, 98. Then that mode's 82 because the mode occurs the most and 82 occurs twice there. And it's useful for working with nominal level data. What nominal level data is, it's categorical. What I mean by categorical is there's no real ranking value, right? You know, you got brown eyes, blue eyes, for example, left-handed, right-handed, uh, male, female. Those are all uh, nominal level categories because they're just, you know, things you can put people into. Like, you can put people in the buckets and, you know, this obviously you can use more than people. For example, Louisville, that's a city, which you can't really rank one city above the other, not like, not unless you're, like, going with, like, population or something like that. But, you know, the, the name of the city, Louisville, um, in itself, it doesn't really have any, inher any inherent value when compared to like say Detroit. So categorical things, uh, no number ranking. So more examples include zip codes. There are numbers, but you know, there's no numeric meaning to those numbers. They're just identifiers. So security numbers is all, uh, another one. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, like I said, cities, towns, states, gender, sex, eye color, what hand you are. And the list can go on and on and on and on. You know, so that is nominal level. Um, ordinal. Now, what ordinal is, and since you know it's down here at the bottom, you see ordinal down at the bottom. And I'm going to grab a pin. Well, I was already in pin mode. So you can see here your ordinal 
um, and your interval ratio. These are the other uh, categories that we're going to talk about with numbers. But ordinal is, it. Uh, you're still in categories, but now you have rank value in said categories. So, for example, socioeconomic income, when we're just talking about like classes of people, like working class, middle class, upper class, those are ranked ordered, but they're a little bit more generic. And we have them in the, like the buckets, right? So, you know, we can say that, for example, working class is like $0 to, I don't know, 32000 or something like that. Uh, and that's how much money working class is. And after that, we can move up to middle class and kind of hit buckets in that ordinal level. Other ordinal level categories are things like on the survey where you see strongly disagree, slightly disagree, disagree, or, well, strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree. And we'll just keep it simple. So um, that's uh, like a uh, yeah, like kind of like a, a dial that you can push up, you know, up and down. Uh, and they do have ranking value and understand it as ranking value, uh, but they're not specific and exact. Now, interval ratio is specific and exact, like height, weight. You have an exact number. That's interval ratio data. Um, you can include temperatures and then ratio. You know, interval and ratio. Those are two separate ones. Ratio can go into negatives. Um, here is interval does not. So there we have that in the mode, of course. The median is the number that occurs in the middle. Half of all cases will have higher, half of all cases will have lower uh, scores. And the cases must be placed in order of highest to lowest. And the number of cases is odd, then the median will always be that middle case. And if the number of cases is even, you take those two numbers in the middle. And then you divide them by two and you get the median. So I'm just going to draw this out real quick. Let's say we have a, da a data set of two, five, three, uh, four, and one. First, we would have to arrange these in order. So one, cross that out. So we, two, cross that out. Three, look at that. Four, we're just counting the five. And five. So this is an even amount, so we identify the number in the middle, one on each side, one on each side, and three would be our median. Okay. Now let's say that we did the same thing, but we added the number six. Then we would, you know, cross out the numbers on the sides, cross that out on the side, and then suddenly we have two. So we just go three plus four is 7, and then you divide the 7 by 2, which I believe is 3.5, and, and that would be your median for that set. And uh, that's how you get your median. You cannot calculate uh, your median at a categorical level or a nominal level, and the reason is, as you recall, we cannot rank order like we did here. It's You just can't say, oh, you know, Green eyes has a value of one, and blue eyes has a value of two, so we can rank order that. No, while you will be assigning numbers to these as like identifiers, like you know, of course, the social security number, they don't have any rank of value or measure, so you cannot calculate median on things that have no value. Moving forward, so for percentiles, uh, a common way to report statistics is using percentiles. Um, this identifies the, uh, the point that um, I end up making another normal curve up there. This identifies the uh, a point to which you know a score falls. And you know they give you an example of this. Let, let's imagine that we're in a competition. So if you place first place in a competition, which means the top score, you're 100th percentile, meaning you're the highest thing that you can possibly get. Now if you got last of whatever, right, then you are in the zero percentile. And then you got everything in between depending on you know your rank order like it'll say second place would be like you know like 92nd percentile or something it depends on how many people are, are participating so you know using my in-class example that I did earlier uh, well we can say like you know we have five contenders and the first one would be the 100th percentile you know the one that placed first and then the guy that placed second since there are five people he would be the 80th percentile because you know he's in the top 80 he's in the top you know 20 percent but you know because there's five, you divide that to 20. So if you want to, um, this is a great way to, re you know, uh, report competition scores. It's also like on test scores, like your ACT and SAT, you know, that's how uh, one way to determine your score in GRE. 
Uh, there's all kinds of ways to use this cool little stat. And um, so I'm going to, you can see down here where you can calculate it, you multiply, you can say that you have 78 cases and you want to find the 37th percentile. Well, you take 78 and you multiply that by 0.37 and then that result equals 37th percentile is 28.86 and we can just round that up to 29. Okay. Um, we'll move forward. So th in order to calculate the mean, calculating the mean over here, then we have to start learning to speak statistics. So this right here is called X crossbar. Okay. And that just means mean. Mean equal. And we have sigma. That's a sigma. And what sigma mean is? Sigma means sum of. Okay. X, as you can see, is the sum of X. X being the numbers in your data set. Okay. So let's say, just for, for simplicity's sake, we'll, again, we'll go with 1, 3, and 5. We're just going to sigma that, or sum of 1, 3, and 5. So 1 plus 3 is 4 plus 5 is 9. So, you know, 9. So that's the sum of your data set. And then using the same example in would be the number of things in your data. So in, we'll just put that up here. So we have one, two, three numbers. So what this would look like is is mean equal sum of, again, so 4, 9, so that's the sum, divided by 3, okay, and the average, as you guessed it, 3, okay, so there we go, that is the um, mean. So inferential statistics are tools for drawing conclusions about populations based on observations from randomly selected from populations. Okay, a population is everything in one place or thing or whatever, right? So I'll be give you I'll give you an example. You can say the University of Louisville and the students at University of Louisville. Those form a population because they're all part of a group, and they're all part of an exact group. Now let's say that we want to take a sample. We have to take everything. Take, we have to count for everyone in that population, and we'll take 10 random students. And that would be our sample from the population of University of Louisville. So population is the whole thing, and the sample is you pull uh, some people from that population. There are many methods to random sample. You can pick from a hat. You can use a program, and so on. So let's kind of overview these types of random sample. For, your, for First of all, we have simple random sample. And uh, names of a hat do represent your simple random sample. So random set ramples that simple random sample conditions include selection is by method of chance. Okay, each case has an equal chance of being selected, and the selection of each case is independent of each other. Now, uh, your homework assignment does not do uh, simple random sampling. Just for a heads up, okay? So don't get these two confused. They're two different principles. So let's say that we have, you know, a bucket or a bowl. And we have three marbles. One marble, we'll call uh, we'll call that the black marble. And then we have another color marble. We have uh, we'll go with this color marble, a red marble. And then we have another color marble. We'll call it the blue marble. Okay, so we have three marbles. And every time that we, uh, you know, we, we do, so let's go over these uh, conditions, okay? Selection is by method of chance, okay? So, you know, we randomly put our hand in there, mix them up, and draw one marble. So that is method of chance, okay? Each case has an equal chance of being selected, okay? And as you can see, uh, you know, when we go for our random chance, we do have an equal chance of pulling any of those three marbles uh, by virtue of the design. So, you know, you have three marbles. And then in the selection of each case is independent of the selection of other cases. Meaning, all that really means is we reach our hand and say we draw the black marble. Well, 
we say, okay, we drew the black marble out of three marbles, one out of three, and then we put the marble back in the bucket and say that we draw it again. Well, this time we drew a red marble. Well, it's still one out of three. We put it back in, and we keep going until infinity, right? And that would be simple random selection. The independence of observation of some assumption asserts that pairs or groups of cases do not share some unmeasured factor that makes scores similar. Uh, this is uh, meaning like you just can't have two data uh, points influencing each other. It's bad. Okay, don't have data points influence each other. Uh, and the example here is like uh, you know students cheating on an exam. If person A is has all the answers and person B does not know anything about the answers, right? And your test is designed to, you know, of course, test knowledge. So you're testing knowledge. And then person B copies person A. Well, then person B is not being tested at all. So what that means is it violates this, okay? And that would screw up your, your sampling too. So sample error and sampling distributions. Recall our brief lesson on population versus uh, sample, okay? So for sampling error, what you do is you take the sample statistic minus population parameter, okay? Sample statistic only estimate population parameters, okay? So for instance, due to the luck of draw, the mean your random sample of child abuse and neglect cases almost assuredly different from that of the population. So let's say the mean of, of people, let's say we pulled five, let's say we have 100 people in the population, right? Okay? And then we did a random sample of 10. So we would take the mean of of both numbers okay so let's say in this case the mean in the sample was eight and a half years so we got eight and a half years on the sample of ten like so that's a crazy five it's a real crazy five but it's a five and then the full population however when we average like you know how many years i don't know they lived a child abuse or something right it came out to be nine what that means is we have to calculate sample error and that is sample statistic which is uh eight point five and our population uh, uh, parameter, okay, which would be minus 9, okay, meaning our error term is negative 0.5. That's just, you know, and you'd have to keep pulling sa samples, right? That's the point of samples. You can pull several samples uh, until, you know, you get to a, a, a better error term. Speaking of samples, due to the real world being the real world, the sample population parameter is typically unknown. So we use a tool called the sampling distribution to combat this problem. Now this is, this video right here is for the last question on your assignment. And um, so the sampling distribution is the distribution of a statistic that results from selecting an infinite number of random samples of the same population. Now what do I mean by that? Well, you can watch the video and check it out for yourself, okay? Um, but essentially, uh, I'll go over the question on the assignment when we get there, and I'll explain it more, okay? Your standard error starts with sampling distribution of the mean. And the sampling distribution of the mean is a frequency distribution composed of all of the means of an infinite number of a random samples of all the same size, all selected from the same population. Getting a little kind of meta here. So to build this sampling distribution, the researcher must select a random sample of a given size of population, calculate that sample's mean, plot that mean, and then repeat step 1, 2, 3 an infinite number of times. This is exactly what you're going to do for question, I believe, 8. The last question. To build a sampling distribution, again, you select a random, number sam a random sample of a given size from the population. Okay, and then calculate the sample's mean, and then plot that mean, and then repeat steps 1, 2, and 3 an infinite number of times. More on that when we get to the assignment. Okay, central limit theorem, we can't do infinite math, so we let statistical theory build our distribution. Central limit theorem states, number one, its mean is equal to the means in the population for which samples were randomly selected. Okay, so you want to try to get your mean matching your population for your, from your sample. If standard deviation equals the standard deviation of population, okay, and as sample size increases, its shape approaches normality. Again, this is your normal curve, in a way, okay. I'm just going to put the tails right here, put the tail right there. So, in other words, you want your your population here. You take all the numbers from it, you know, your average, your mean, your median. Well, your mean, your median, your mode, in this case, for what you know. And you want to try to take, a, take an infinite number of samples, in this case, however many samples it takes, until your, your error basically approaches zero. Um, that way we get... 
uh, a good read on the data or with our samples. Okay, so I want to uh, you can watch the video there if you uh, for a, a good explanation of central limit theorem as well besides the one I just gave you, which is you know pretty good uh, explanation too if I must say. And um, I want to pull up uh, the assignment next. Uh, let's pull this up. Go to assignments. Pre-work one. And let's go over this real quick. So the assignments actually do on the 30th. Okay. And um, so the first question is calculate the mode. This is the data that you so calculate the mode of that number, of that, that data set. You want to code it. You want to uh, calculate the the median. The median here. I'm sorry, I have the hiccups. You want to calculate the average of trash cans, and this can come out to be a decimal. I know decimal trash cans are weird, but it can come out to be a decimal, and I'll explain. You know, because you know you can actually have a legitimate decimal in trash cans. It's not, it's not to say that you know you have three and a half trash cans. It's just to say that in American households, for example, uh, people will have between three and four trash cans in it. That's the best way to think about that. So, and then define and provide an example of a nominal level variable. Define and provide an example of an ordinal level variable. Define and provide an example of an interval level and a ratio variable. And recall the differences in those from the sample. Now, let's get to the meat and potatoes here. Of, of this assignment and um, I'm just going to snip this out so for instance for this uh, it's saying we'll go black the and create a sampling distribution with the following data five six and nine create consult the PowerPoint for a little picture okay so we have five six and nine and this represents our population. So that's our pop, our population. Now, if we were to take a random sample, let's say we can take a random sample of two. Okay? So let's take a random sample. So we take, we draw them randomly, we get five and six. Okay? As our first numbers. So what we do is we then take five plus six, okay, eleven, divide that by two to get uh, five and a half. Okay. Now I'm going to go down here and create a distribution. Okay. So I'm just going to do a sample of three. So three. Well, let's go up to five since we, you know, we can possibly draw five times. And we're going to go. We're actually going to start at like. Yeah, we start at one. Two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So our first one, our data point goes for five and a half. So we're just going to put the data point right here. Now let's go pull another one. Let's say we're going to pull five and nine this time because we're replacing the number. Remember, we're replacing the number. So this will be 14. 14 divided by 2 is 7. So we go down here and we mark 7. Now let's say we pull another sample. This time we pull um, 5 and 6 again. So we go down, we got an 11 again divided by 2 is 5 and a half. And we, you know, we keep going until we exhaust our options. Uh, we can go 5, 5, 5, 6, 5, 9. 6, 9, 6, 5, and so on and so forth. And we're, we're just going to fill out our data points. And then we're just going to, you know, d plot the distribution, like so. And that's how you do um, your last question, question 8. And um, if you have any questions on any of that stuff, just let me know. I'm going to end the, the video recording here. Um, be sure to email me if you have any questions, or you can, like, you know, you can do uh, contact me any means whatsoever. So. Thank you, and I will see you next week in the video lecture.